In the decade and a half since it first entered service, the Lockheed Martin F-22 Raptor has been an air superiority fighter without equal. But that hasn't always been the case. For a short time in the 1990s, the YF-22 that would lead to the operational F-22 may have met its match in the form of the Northrop YF-23. It's honestly pretty safe to say that either of these highly capable airframes would have resulted in a dominant air superiority fighter that would have also have been the first of a new generation. But the truth is, performance may not have been the ultimate deciding factor between these two jets. You see, perception is everything, even in the airplane business. Way back in the 1980s, the US Air Force started hunting for a new kind of fighter, one that could dominate the latest generation of Soviet jets like the Su-27 and the MiG-29. While the Soviet Union was less than a decade away from collapse, their fighters were still highly capable fourth-generation platforms, developed specifically to counter America's premier fighters, the air superiority F-15 Eagle and the multi-purpose F-16 Fighting Falcon. Rather than continuing to develop ever more powerful and higher flying fighters, as had really been the norm throughout much of the Cold War, the Air Force wanted to incorporate a newer and uniquely American capability into their next generation fighter. That capability, of course, was stealth. But stealth wasn't the only thing America wanted to get out of its new jet. Among the other requirements was the ability to supercruise, or to maintain supersonic speeds without using the aircraft's afterburners. The ability to supercruise would mean that this new fighter would be able to close with enemy jets at a high rate of speed without sacrificing much in the way of fuel, ensuring the new fighter would have plenty of fight left in the tank after a long haul to the battle space. Before the Air Force even knew who would build this new jet, they knew that they wanted to order around 750 of them so that they could replace the F-15 Eagle as America's first line of defense against inbound Soviet bombers and fighters. And by the end of 1986, two teams had been chosen to develop their own next-generation fighter concepts. Northrop teamed up with McDonnell Douglas, while Lockheed, Boeing, and General Dynamics assembled their opposition. Both Lockheed and Northrop already had experience in developing stealth platforms for the U.S. Air Force. Lockheed, of course, had been responsible for the world's first operational stealth aircraft in the F-117 Nighthawk. And while Northrop had lost out to Lockheed in that very competition, they continued working on their stealth concept until it matured into the B-2 Spirit, which remains in service to this day. While the F-22 Raptor bears a passing resemblance to conventional fourth-generation fighters, despite its stealth design, the YF-23 was rather unconventional. Like the F-22, it utilized diamond-shaped wings to reduce its radar signature, but the two diverged dramatically in the nose and tail sections. The YF-23's nose was striking, with its cockpit pushed forward on the airframe for improved visibility and a drooping duckbill of a nose adding to the platform's alien aesthetic. On the back, an all-moving V-tail gave the fighter incredible maneuverability despite the platform lacking in the F-22's thrust vectoring capabilities. Ultimately, Northrop built two YF-23 prototypes. The first, dubbed the Black Widow II by those involved with the program, was all black and powered by a pair of Pratt & Whitney engines that allowed the jet to supercruise at Mach 1.43 during its first round of testing, all the way back in 1990. The second YF-23 was painted all gray and dubbed the Gray Ghost. It switched to General Electric YF-120 engines, which offered improved supercruise capabilities, reaching Mach 1.6 in testing, narrowly beating out the YF-22's Mach 1.58. While the YF-23's top speed remains classified to this day, defense analysts have claimed that it was better than Mach 2. However, the operational F-22 today beats both of those marks, with a top speed of Mach 2.25 and the ability to supercruise at an astonishing Mach 1.82. As may come as a surprise to many, the YF-23 actually proved to be stealthier than its competitor though it was seen as less maneuverable than the thrust vectoring YF-22. Thrust vector control allows the pilot to aim the outlet of the jet's thrust independently of the aircraft to dramatically increase maneuverability, even allowing the aircraft to continue flying in one direction as it points its nose in another. 
Northrop opted not to include thrust vector control in their YF-23 design in favor of a stealthier radar profile and lighter overall platform. Instead, they used the large surfaces on the YF-23's unique V-tail to help the fighter turn on a dime, and the truth is, it managed performance that was nearly comparable to the F-22's, despite its lack of thrust vector control. Ultimately, while the YF-23 could just about match the F-22's acrobatics, Lockheed won the Perception War by demonstrating their fighters' capabilities in a much more dynamic way. Lockheed test pilots showed off the aircraft's ability to utilize a high angle of attack, fired missiles, and executed maneuvers that placed more than 9 G's worth of force on their airframe. Northrop's YF-23 could very literally have done all the same things. They just didn't in their demonstration. Today, many contend that it was that salesmanship, rather than strictly platform capabilities, that helped the YF-22 stand out in the minds of defense officials and decision makers. The most notable place where the YF-23 had a clear advantage was in fuel range. Early in the design stages for these aircraft, the U.S. Navy had planned to adopt the winner as a replacement for their own aging fourth-generation intercept fighter, the F-14 Tomcat. The YF-23's combat radius was significantly greater than the YF-22's, which, when coupled with its slightly better stealth profile, meant the YF-23 could fly further into contested airspace, where refueling just isn't an option. It's safe to say that today, that capability would be coveted among Navy officials, as the branch continues to work toward finding ways to extend the combat radius of carrier-borne fighters. Both Northrop's YF-23 and Lockheed's YF-22 were clearly extremely capable fighters. Northrop's YF-23 offered greater range and superior stealth, while the YF-22 used more advanced avionics and had a slight advantage in maneuverability. As Air Force Secretary Donald Rice pointed out upon awarding the contract to Lockheed, they really ended up with two jets that could meet the Air Force's technical specifications and technical requirements. And to be clear, either option would have been a game-changing platform, and the first of the fifth generation. But despite Northrop's excellent aircraft, the company itself was seen as less capable and maybe even less trustworthy than Lockheed. For four long years leading up to this competition, Northrop had faced repeated scrutiny and even some serious allegations throughout their product line, leading to a series of congressional committee hearings and a number of Pentagon audits. Even if the Air Force really wanted the YF-23 way more than the YF-22, they were aware that Northrop's reputation would make the fighter a tough sell among lawmakers. And that's not even me extrapolating. Major General Joseph W. Ralston, who was the head of tactical fighter requirements for the Air Force at the time, said, and I quote, The thing I like about the Lockheed proposal is that the Air Force has confidence that the contractor team can deliver at the cost the Air Force estimated. Of course, now we know that wouldn't prove to be true, but it was certainly the prevailing sentiment at the time. Some analysts have also pointed out that Lockheed wasn't building any fighter airframes at the time whereas Northrop was already in the F-A-18 Hornet business. Giving Lockheed the contract would help ensure both firms were still building aircraft and still well-positioned to compete for other contracts in the future. Of course, the belief that Lockheed was better suited to deliver the next-generation fighter on budget was quickly dashed, when in 1997, a report came out indicating that a Defense Department review of the program was already projecting that it could ultimately go over budget by as much as $17 billion, or around $26 billion in today's money. Ultimately, America's F-22 Raptors would each cost more than $200 million, and the program was scrapped with only 186 of the intended 750 built. That reduced volume, of course, didn't help with the increased per unit cost. Today, the F-22 Raptor remains the most capable air superiority fighter on the planet, but it exists in dwindling numbers. Because most of its production line was cannibalized in favor of Lockheed Martin's F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, the F-22 may be a highly capable predator, but it's also an endangered species. And if you want to learn more about that, I highly recommend you check out our video about why we can't build more F-22 Raptors. So would an F-23 have managed to avoid those same cost overruns and even an early demise? 
The truth is, it's impossible to say, but Northrop Grumman still plays a vital role in America's stealth game. The forthcoming B-21 Raider promises to be the most advanced bomber ever to take to the sky, and if government press releases are to be believed, the program is not only on time, it's more or less on budget, which are two things Lockheed Martin isn't exactly known for these days. Without some really dramatic air combat, we really can't conclusively say that the YF-23 could have matched or even outperformed the F-22 had it ever gone into production. But maybe we can conclusively say that much like Rocky and Apollo Creed at the end of Rocky III, we don't always need to know who wins to know that they both had what it took to take home the championship belt. And with that wistful idea ends yet another edition of Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, don't forget to click like and subscribe down below and feel free to leave me a comment. I love going through and reading them all. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.